for that introduction. Today I'm here to talk about Sequoia, which is a new OpenPGP implementation. Most people, when they hear OpenPGP, they think about GNU PG. And uh, we've learned from that, and we have a new implementation, and it's in Rust. And I want to tell you about some of our experiences trying to implement OpenPGP in Rust. And this talk is actually done with my colleague, Eustace Winter, who's down there. And uh, it's uh, from both of us, basically. So Sequoia, what is Sequoia? The first commit was done in October 16th, 2017, so the project is just over a year old. And we decided to do a new OpenPGP implementation for a number of reasons, but kind of the primary motivator was based on our experience using GNU PG. So we actually hacked on GNU PG for several years and we discovered that GNU PG is actually kind of hard to modify. The project itself is now 21, almost 22 years old. The code has grown organically. There aren't that many unit tests. And one thing we observed that there's a lot of tight component coupling. Talking to developers, we've discovered that GNU PG's API isn't so easy to use. They're, they're unsatisfied with it. It doesn't do exactly what they want and they end up writing a lot of code in order to work around uh, GNU PG's idea of how things should be done. And one of the major reasons we decided to use Rust is its safety properties, in particular its memory safety. So we thought it was irresponsible to do a new security sensitive tool in a language that didn't offer the type of things that Rust offered. And finally, there was a non-technical reason to consider uh, doing a new OpenPGP implementation, and that's because GNU PG is under the GPL, and unfortunately, you can't use GPL software in the iOS store, or the iOS app store. So who are we? Who's working on this project? There's three of us who are working on it more or less full-time, and, and they're down here, so Justus and also Kai, and we all were former GNU PG developers. We worked there for two, two and a half years, and since the fall of 2017, so since the project started, we've been at PEP. And PEP stands for Pretty Easy Privacy, and PEP is working on tools to make, in particular, email encryption easy to use for everyone. Our funding comes primarily from PEP, which is, there's a, a company aspect and also a, a foundation, and the Walhallen Stiftung is also providing some funding. And one thing that we hope to do in the middle term is actually uh, diversify our funding base, so we're all at the PEP Foundation, and it would be nice if there were other organizations involved as well. So that's my introduction to Sequoia, but what is OpenPGP? So I've talked to a few people here today, and although many people know about GNUPG, there are some people who aren't that familiar with it. So I want to give you a very brief introduction. It's a standard for encryption, data authentication, and integrity. And the standard is, was produced by the IETF, it's RFC 4880. And although people associate OpenPGP with email, it's not just for email. It's used for lots of things. And it's actually a core part of the internet. So it's used for package signing whenever you download a package from a Debian archive, apt automatically checks to make sure that the signature is good. Uh, commit signing, document signing, backups, archives, encrypted storage in the cloud, Encrypted sneaker net, so if you have a USB stick and you want to encrypt some files, then bring them someplace else. You can't use something like Signal for that. You need something like a new PG. There are password managers that use OpenPGP. You can do remote authentication using OpenPGP. So it's a very general purpose standard. And it's a packet-based format. So an OpenPGP message is composed of a number of packets. In a certain sense, you can compose them in an arbitrary manner but the standard specifies a grammar, so it's not as flexible as uh, many people make it out to be. When you have some data that you want to encrypt or something, you first pack it into a container called a literal data packet. If you want to sign it, then you actually use two packets, a signature and a one-pass signature packet. And the reason that you have two things is that it allows streaming operations. So. OpenPGP is not only used for email, it's used for backups, as I said before. Backups can be gigabytes or even terabytes large. Obviously doesn't fit in memory. And so somehow you have to be able to stream it. 
not only when you're doing the verification process, but also when you're generating it. And this enables that streaming um, mechanism. There's a compression container, a so-called SIP container, which is, stands for a symmetrically encrypted data packet. So like most crypto schemes, you don't use public key encryption to encrypt large amounts of data. You generate a, a session key, you use something like AES to encrypt the bulk data, and then you only encrypt the session key using the very slow and expensive public key cryptography. So let's look at an open PCP message in detail. Let's say we wanna say hello to someone. So we take our data and we encapsulate it in an open PCP packet, in particular a literal data packet. So now we don't just have some random data, it has a format, there's this container format, literal data. And then we want to sign it. So we stick this one pass signature in the front and the signature at the end. And then we encrypt it. We put the whole thing in a SIP container. And at the front, we have the PKESK, which is used for containing the encrypted session key. And if you think about what I just described, it functions a little bit like a pipe. So you take your data, you pipe it through a, a literal data container type thing. You pipe that into a signature generation type thing, and you pipe that into a encryption type thing. And by the way, open PCP messages are also used for key exchange. So if you want to send somebody a key, like your key in particular, you would also use an open PCP message, and there's a public key packet, a public subkey packet, user ID packet, and a bunch of others that aren't quite so important. So that's an introduction to open PCP, and now I want to get into our implementation. And I don't want to show you too much of our API, but what I want to show you instead is sort of the challenges that we faced trying to implement Sequoia in Rust. And there are five major challenges that we encountered and uh, that I'm going to present today. So we have this, this pipeline that we want to process. And you can imagine that you have the application on top and it's reading from some sort of reader. So you have IO read. So we can actually, because it looks like a pipeline, create a stack of readers. Now the hashed reader, which is used for generating the signature, isn't te technically transforming the data, but it is doing some sort of computations, and so visualizing it as a pipe is still useful conceptually. And here we see that there are kind of three elements in our pipe, but in practice, there are other things that you're worried about. For instance, framing. So you want to enforce packet boundaries. Uh, OpenPGP has the idea of a chunked encoding scheme, like in HTTP. And these things somehow, somehow have to be dealt with as well. And using this type of uh, pipeline idea is natural and it offers a nice separation of concerns while still preserving this idea of streaming proce uh, streamed processing. So the first thing that you do when you start using OpenPGP or start writing an OpenPGP implementation is that you want to somehow parse a message. And before coming up with some sort of crazy API, the message looks a little bit like a tree, so you kind of start implementing a parser, you do a depth-first traversal of the OpenPGP message, this looks a little bit like the visitor pattern, and it basically all happens in the stack. And when you visit each packet, then you can imagine calling some sort of callback. So here's the basic idea. We have a compressed data packet, and at the very top we have a parse function, and we read the, the algorithm, we generate a compressed packet, and uh, push the filter onto our reader stack, and then we call parse, which is our general purpose demuxer for processing any packet. Because a compressed packet can contain any other type of packet. When you try to compile that, Rust complains. It says you've reached the recursion limit while instantiating this really, really, really long pipe type. So what happened there? Well, it turns out that Rust isn't able to recognize base cases when you're doing recursion with the type system. And we have the generic parser calling the compressed data packet parser, which in turn calls the generic parser, and so we get that really long type. And there's kind of the obvious thing, which is that, well, okay, we, we need to articulate a base case, but we can't tell the compiler that. There's no way to express that in Rust right now. But there's also this other aspect which is, is kind of interesting and insightful, I think, which is that generics can result in a lot of kind of invisible types that maybe you don't actually need in practice. 
because in general, nobody's going to create 16 uh, levels of compression containers. It's just going to make your message bigger and bigger. And in order to work around this, you need to use dynamic dispatch. And so if you've been in the Rust community and or, or when you start learning Rust, you hear, ah, generics, generics, they solve all your problems and they're super fast. But you really do sometimes want dynamic dispatch and avoiding boxing is, is, is oftentimes completely unnecessary and only results in more problems. So we need to think about a different way to do the parsing and we want to use some sort of dynamic dispatch in order to create these filters. So we create a, a generic reader stack. So what that means is that we're operating on some sort of reader and we don't actually know what the concrete type is. And then we're done parsing it and we need to pop off the current container and continue working. So we need something like into inner. But due to type erasure, we don't actually know what the concrete type is. Right? We have some sort of dynamic dispatch going on. So how can we recover the inner? So if you've looked at a bunch of uh, Rust types that do this type of encapsulation, then the into inner method is usually implemented on the concrete type. But we need it for trait objects. But trait objects are unsized. Right? When you take into inner, you consume the object, and then you give back the inner thing. And if trait objects are unsized, then you can't actually pass self because self has to be sized. Well, it turns out that there's a fourth variant of the self argument. So you can have self with just a normal reference, a mutable reference, or an owned one, or you can have a boxed self. So this was a, a discovery that I found after uh, looking at the documentation for a long time and chatting on IRC. And it was a, a very insightful thing for me, and I hope it's also a little bit insightful for you. So we go ahead and we take self, and it's a box, and now we can work with our trait object. And in this particular API, we don't just return the inner, we turn an option inner, and this is needed in order to handle the recursion base case where you're reading, for instance, from a file, and of course, a file has no inner. But working with box objects is ugly, right? Imagine that you have a, a reader and it's on the stack, why do you have to box it if it's just on the stack? So if all of your API requires boxed reader, or buffered reader as we call it, then you're doing this boxing and unboxing, and it's just kind of, it's not terribly ergonomic. You can use a transparent forwarder, so you do implement buffered reader for boxed buffered reader, and then you take self, you do as ref. As ref is a neat little function that takes a box and turns it into a reference. And then you can call the uh, actual method that you want to call on the inner thing. Or not on the inner thing, but on the, uh, the unboxed thing. And this happens without actually having a concrete type. It's all dynamic dispatch. And so now we can pass a box buffered reader wherever a buffered reader is needed, which means that we can simplify our API, right? Because our API doesn't say boxed buffered reader, it says buffered reader, and if we have a box buffered reader, we just pass it in, and we can also pass in normal buffered readers. So that's cool, but it creates a linked list. So let's look at our API a little bit more closely. We have a new method which we use for constructing, in this case, a buffered reader limiter, which is used to make sure that you can only read so many bytes from a particular uh, buffered reader. So we pass in a reader, and since we have this nice transparent forwarder, we can also pass in a boxed buffered reader. And then we have into inner. Well, into inner takes a box self and returns the inner self. Now, the inner self is an R. An R is a buffered reader, or something that implements buffered reader. And due to the return type, we're forced to box it. So we have to do box R. But if R happened to be already boxed, we now have two boxes. And if you pop things on the stack and then pop them off and pop something else on the stack and pop it off, and you do that a whole bunch of times, you now have n boxes. So you have this enormous linked list. And we actually discovered this bug when we were trying to parse the whole SKS dump. So we were going really fast. We were doing about 1.5 million packets per second. And then after 10 seconds, we were down to a half million packets. And after 20 seconds, we were down to a few thousand packets per second. And 
Eustace took a look and tried to figure out what's going on and then realized that we created this enormous linked list that had millions of elements in it. So that was slow, completely blew the cache, and we realized that we had to change the, the API. So that was a, an unfortunate thing, which was a consequence of this kind of type erasure and one of the ergonomic aspects of Rust, right? So there, there are still kind of these, these edges there, even though they offer this amazing amount of convenience. So now we have our buffered reader interface. How are we gonna do a better parser interface? Because this visitor pattern is just not what we want, right? The, we don't want to use callbacks. It's not Rust-like. We want an iterator-like API. And as I already said, it's very important that our API uh, support streaming because we want to be able to parse these, parse these big messages. So how do we do an iterator interface? Well, what if we just use the iterator interface that Rust provides? It would look like this. We'd instantiate, instantiate a packet parser, given some underlying reader like a file, and then we'd call iter, and we'd iterate all of the data. Now, we want to support streaming, and we have our literal data packet, so we want to copy it out to say standard out. Well, if we're working with the packet itself, the thing that the iterator returned, we can't actually do that, because the thing that was actually returned has no reference to the packet parser anymore, right? So the, the reader that we have is in the packet parser, but the item that we got back from the iterator has no connection to the packet parser anymore. So we can only return fully processed packets. That's not good for streaming operations. We'd have to read everything into memory. So the alternative is that we go ahead and pass the reader in the iterator with, for instance, a reference. Well, it turns out you can't do that due to lifetimes because you can have multiple items that are alive at the same time. And we definitely require a mutable reference, right? Because we're reading from a file, so we have to do some sort of adjustments on the cursor. So the uh, iterator API just doesn't provide what we want. And the other problem is that we kind of want to preserve the structure of the OpenPGP message, right? It looks like a tree. And using the iterator, it effectively flattens the whole tree structure. So that's a little bit sad that we lost that information. There are ways to recover it, but it's just a, a side observation. So how can we create an iterator-like API that still supports all of our requirements? Well, this is what we came up with in the end. We use a while let, and we have a, a type called PPR, or a packet parser result. And the packet parser result contains the packet that we're currently parsing. So we're still able to do streaming operations on the current packet. And then when we're done doing the streaming operations, we get the next object. And at the same time, the packet parser returns the item that we're currently working on. And now we own the item. So we can go ahead and squirrel it away in a vector if we want which you sometimes want to do when you have, for instance, the PKESK, or we can just throw it away. So there are kind of three phases. The first phase is where we do the streaming, then we have the next phase, and then we have the phase where we actually own the packet. And here we're using PP recurse to get the next packet. And so you're at a container boundary. For instance, you have a compression container. When you use recurse, it steps into the container and gets the next packet. But if you use next, it treats the container as if it were just an opaque packet and moves to the next thing in the, the tree, so the, the sibling or a potential uncle or aunt. The next challenge that we had was dealing with callbacks that save state. So when you have a callback, Sometimes you want to collect some statistics, for instance, or you want to do some processing, or you somehow need to return a result. And it's inconvenient to kind of return it via the callbacks result. In C, you do this using a, a cookie. So here we have a callback state at the top, which is a structure. Then we have our actual callback, so the thing that the, our function is going to call. And it takes the cookie. 
Then we convert this void pointer into our actual cookies type. We can do whatever type of processing we want. We save our information in there. And then when the function returns, our state here at the bottom is filled with whatever the callback inserted into the cookie. Now, that's the idiomatic way to do that in C, but in Rust, that's hard to do because you need a mutable reference, and all of a sudden you get some sort of crazy uh, errors from Rust's borrow checker, and it doesn't work out so nicely. So what can we do instead? Well, in Rust, you don't need to use a cookie, you can use a trait, because a trait can transparently encapsulate whatever type of state you want. So here we have a so-called callback helper, which has a function signature in it called callback, and it has no cookie in it, right? This is the thing that the function is going to call. And then we implement this trait for our own type, so for our cookie. So here we have a struct callback, and we can insert whatever fields we want in there. And then, when our function, down here at the bottom, uh, wants to invoke the callback, we pass it the structure, which implements the trait, and then the callback calls that particular method. And it works beautifully. And there's no sort of playing with the type system or fighting with the borrower of checker. It's, it's very natural. And when you see this, it is kind of obvious, oh, yeah, that's an easy way to do it. But it took us a while to figure out uh, that pattern. In Sequoia, we use failure, which is a, a very nice trait. And uh, we also use general purpose traits, like IO read. And we want our consumers to be able to get our rich errors somehow. And you want to be able to smuggle out these failures somehow via IO error. You can use this, or do this, using failure compat. So here I have uh, an example of how you can do this. We do a little bit of downcasting. And either we have an IO error, or maybe we have a failure. And then we can do some sort of conversion. It's all a little bit magic. And then you can recover it. From here, we have IO copy. We get our result. We do a map error. We can recover our failure, or if we have a plain IO error, we get the plain IO error back. Verifier is our uh, custom reader that supports the, the failure interface. And of course, IOCopy doesn't, but still we're able to somehow get it back. We've opened up a, an issue and provided a, at least a partial solution for the failure crate, and we hope that without boats, we'll, we'll take a look at it eventually. So using this pattern, you're still able to use these rich errors that you have or work with them, even though the current API doesn't quite support them. So those are the major challenges that we faced. And maybe I've kind of piqued your interest in Sequoia. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Sequoia's low-level API is about 98% feature complete. It includes a CFFI. As part of developing Sequoia, we ported a number of applications to Sequoia, including the PEP engine, which is where I work. And one thing we found is even though we've only implemented a low-level API so far, it only requires about a 60%, only requires 60% as much code as the version of PEP using GPG. So we're particularly pleased about that. We also have a GPG V replacement, which is the tool that, for instance, uh, apt uses to verify packages. We have a new key server implementation that Kai has worked on, and we've done experiments porting other software. So it's been very important to us to get lots of experience with the API before we do a release. And our first release was, uh... well, it's still compiling, but I'm going <laughs> to upload it really soon now. OK, so we're going to release within the minute. By the end of the talk, so this is one of these live demos, right, except we're doing a release. <laughs> And if you're interested, you're welcome to join us. And in fact, we're hiring people. So we're looking for people that have Android and iOS experience, not just to do 
ports to Android and iOS, but to help with uh, more tighter integration in the future. So Sequoia is this new, awesome, we think, open PGP implementation. Uh, our focus is on user-centric development and a strong focus on security. We try to be really portable and highly integrated with the environment, so not just thinking about how things ought to be done, but using the services that the host OS provides. So for instance, on iOS, we want to use the Trusted Enclave. We want to use uh, SystemD on, on Linux when it's there. Our low-level API is already very usable, and if you have a package, within a couple of minutes, you'll be able to add a dependency to Sequoia-OpenPGP and uh, integrate Sequoia into your project. We are on Freenode in the Sequoia channel. We have a mailing list, and you can find our source code on GitLab. Thank you. Okay, time for some questions. Yeah, I know it's harder, the topic, but you can make it. Yeah, so um, I was wondering if you are trying to fill in a void also that is currently with GPG, at least last time I uh, checked, for having a uh, secure and easy to use API to interface with this sort of uh, functionality from a code di directly. As far as I know, GPG only encourages like wrapped command line use m mostly, and not like direct interfacing with this stuff. Is that a con concern at all? So there is a, a library that GPG provides called GPG Me, and yeah. that's a, a C library, and there are also wrappers for other languages. Now in the background, it is indeed calling out to the GPG command line tool. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing because you should kind of be happy that you have process separation. So you might have heard of Heartbleed, which is an OpenSSL bug. And one of the reasons that Heartbleed occurred was because the private keys were held in the same memory as the process. And so there was an error in whatever daemon you happen to have. And it was able to do arbitrary reads. It reads out the private key, and now you're screwed. If you have this process separation, it's not ironclad, right? No security provides uh, protection from everything. But it does provide you protection from those types of errors. So doing this type of separation is sensible. One of the issues that we have with this approach is that GPG-Me offers a subset of the API that GPG supports. And one consequence of this is that people start using GPG-Me, they think, oh, this is a nice library, maybe, and they encounter something that they can't do with GPG-Me, but they can do on the command line. And they say, okay, well, then I'll just shell out to GPG because it can do it on the command line. And they write all of this infrastructure to shell out, parse the output, and then they think, well, wait, why am I using GPG-Me when I already have this infrastructure to shell out? And so we're taking the library first approach and command line second. So Sequoia is firstly a library or a crate in the rest sense. And all of the, uh, inf or all of the functionality is exposed via the library's API. We also provide a command line tool and the command line tool uses the library directly and provides a subset of the library's API. All right, thank you. One more. Wait, Whoever okay. has the better question should ask it. Can you give us a fingerprint of your signing key, please? My signing key, yeah. Okay, then I have a real question, which is, do we have a plan for uh, either the GPG agent or the um, GPG card itself, like talking to the tokens? So this is my uh, signing key. And uh, my main key is up here. <laughs> so in terms of talking to GPG agent from Sequoia, we haven't implemented that support. But 
if you think about GPG agent as being similar to a smart card, then it's not difficult to imagine that once we have smart card support, interfacing with GPG should be, or GPG's agent should be relatively easy. One of the difficulties there is that GPG's agent uses a sort of proprietary um, way of uh, generating the fingerprint. So instead of using OpenPGP's fingerprint, since GPG also supports S-MIME, it has what's called a, a key grip, and a key grip is generated using S expressions and then taking the SHA of the X expression. Uh, so it's kind of ugly, and you have to generate the X expression in the exact right way. So it's, uh, we took a, a look at it as a way of getting early support for doing private key operations and decided that it would be actually just easier to implement the crypto ourselves, or not actually the crypto stuff, but the, uh, using the low-level primitives. And so that's what we did. But um, for practical reasons, it does make sense to consider interfacing with the GPG agent. And there is an issue in our issue tracker. And uh, maybe we'll do that. Actually, we'll probably do that. Okay, thanks, Neil. Thank you.